Then there are issues that have to do with uh, globalization, global economy, globalization of everything, of including the globalization of existence. You know, protest movements, movements now are global. Protest movements that are taking place here in, in, in Egypt now are constantly connected with global movements of protest. So the world is kind of one big uh, space now. But some of the consequences for uh, translation, political consequences, have to do, for example, with the concentration of news reporting now in the hands of a small number of uh, news agencies like Reuters, like Ross, Ross, Associated Press, uh, and the Chinese ones now increasingly. Uh, the concentration of uh, news reporting, mainstream news reporting, in the hands of these uh, small agencies, uh, which are now global. Have, uh, have result, has resulted in um, certain patterns of translation that have political consequences, both for translators and for the world at large. So, for example, one of the consequences is now everything is part of a kind of mainstream process in which uh, translation is almost totally integrated into the editorial work of journalists, with two results. One is that the labor of translation is vast. So that you can't tell what is uh, it is not a translation anymore, and you can't tell uh, what you receive. The people expect, people uh, uh, read quotes from well-known people, even eyewitness, uh, eyewitnesses from various events in the world. They read them in English and they think this is precisely what they said in English. They don't even question that there may be something different, uh, or maybe their understanding of events is different because they, they assume that everything happened and is reported in English. So the fact of translation is, uh, is, is cancelled. And of course, there's also concentration of the reporting itself in the hands of those uh, agencies. As a response to this, you also have, because there's always you know, resistance to everything that happens, you also have an increasing number of uh, groups and projects like Interpress Service, IPS, like Indonesia, which try to balance this by doing their own reporting. These are uh, small groups who uh, are not doing this for profit. They don't like what's happening in kind of through uh, globalization, the concentration of news reporting in the hands of these small numbers of agencies. So they, they, they do their own journalism, they do their own reporting, and they translate this stuff into a lot of different languages, including languages that mainstream reporting doesn't really uh, bother this too much. A lot of this translation, almost all of this kind of translation, is done by volunteer translators, which is another new pattern that uh, really expanded with, uh, with globalization. An awful lot of the translation that goes on and that you uh, experience, particularly on the web, is done by volunteer translators, not by paid translators. And that brings me to uh, the last example of an issue that we can engage with, which is crowdsourcing. I don't know if you understand no one is crowdsourcing. We, people use this a lot of different things how we talk about crowdfunding as well. That's a process where you source whatever you want through the crowd. You don't uh, go and hire somebody to do a job for you. You advertise usually on the web. You say, we're doing this project, uh, either we're crowdfunding for it, so uh, just ordinary people like you and I, if you believe about both send us some money, or crowdsourcing, if you have the kind of expertise we need, we have a lot of money to pay. Uh, usually, sometimes, we have a lot of money to pay, but I also mentioned the big organizations are now doing the same thing. They have the money, but they don't want to pay. And they say to the people, come volunteer uh, for us, do the translation for us, uh, and, and this is good for everybody. Now, crowdsourcing uh, for organizations like Wikipedia, like uh, Facebook, Twitter, all these uh, places, TEDx, uh, is, uh, I mean, in, in some respects, again, you have to engage with it and see the different aspects. It's good because it reduces the digital divide and it makes a lot of knowledge and a lot of material and a lot of languages for people who can make use of it. However, it is also a form of exploitation, and there is actually a petition uh, by a group called Translators for Active Practice, which is available on the web, which is against crowdsourcing of translation because they alert you to the kind of very um, extremely
disclosures of contracts that these organizations uh, make the volunteer translators sign. So these translators volunteer their work, they don't get a penny, and yet they have to sign an agreement that tells them this is a Twitter agreement. You have no rights in anything that you produce. We can offer it any way you like. We can uh, decide not to use it even after you produce it and you, and you go to produce it. So these kinds of things are obviously very problematic and have consequences for the professional community because if people keep relying on crowdsourcing, then obviously the whole community of translators, professional translators, will end up uh, being uh, adversely affected. But also because of these kinds of exploitative uh, practices that are involved in crowdsourcing. Okay, um, I'm going to finish by saying that these are just some of the issues that people raise. I'm going to finish by saying that, of course, in order to raise these issues, debate them uh, profitably in the classroom, uh, and think of more issues, because obviously these are not the only issues, we have to engage with a very broad range of literature. We can't just go to the literature on translation studies, which, to my mind, has so far been very, very disappointing on the issue of ethics in particular. There isn't much really there and, uh, that, that would uh, sustain uh, an MA like this. So we have to go, if this is an interdisciplinary uh, MA, and we have to look at different, sorry, different sources, uh, certainly the literature of ethics, most of which comes from uh, philosophy, that would be important. But not just philosophy, philosophy of communication studies as well um, produces a lot of um, uh, more kind of down to earth uh, literature on ethics. I think ethnography is one of the most important areas we have to engage with because ethnography is, is really all uh, heavily, heavily based on translation, at least traditionally. Uh, today, ethnography is also do ethnography in their own communities, and there may not be a language divide. But traditionally, it was all about going into a community whose language that no one didn't speak, and they had to learn and then live to the community and work with them. And there's extensive, extensive discussion of issues of representation, for instance, in uh, ethnography. How the communities that the ethnography rights are represented, so that's a very important area. Post-colonial theory, definitely. Uh, as we saw the example of Tour of Beauty. Uh, raises issues uh, relevant to, to, to that. Uh, gender studies, uh, much of uh, contemporary uh, latest uh, literature on uh, literary theory, I think, also engages in this. And uh, some of the most recent and more critical literature in uh, translation studies. So we have, we have a big job to do, really, because I think something like this has not been put together before. An MA specifically on the ethics and politics of translation has not been attempted before. As we saw, even in the existing MAs, the issue of ethics is hard, hard to teach in the curriculum. People don't pay much attention. And I think this, this is going to be a ground, groundbreaking uh, master's and we have to work hard to put together something that is coming from a variety of sources uh, and requires engagement with a wide range of literature. But I think uh, once it is available, it will inspire uh, similar development elsewhere in the world, not just in the Arab world, but also in uh, you know, France, Britain, the US, where such uh, MAs, such degrees, simply don't exist. And I'm going to leave you with um, just some suggestions from, strictly from translation studies of uh, uh, publications which do engage with the issue of ethics, sometimes politics as well as in Thea Hermans. Thea Hermans is a very well-known um, figure in translation studies. I know that I know him. He's now an honorary fellow of the University of Manchester, so I'm hoping to be able to bring him across as, as part of the team at some point. And he's certainly written about the politics of uh, translation and the ethics of translation. Um, and I'm happy to read this uh, copy of this PowerPoint. Anywhere because I saw people taking notes practically.